Live. Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we continue our Haunted House retrospective with the 1999 M. Night Shyamalan ghost story, The Sixth Sense, starring Bruce Willis and Haley Joel Osment. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have. So warning, spoilers ahead. You will be spoiled about The Sixth Sense. From Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Jason Henderson, writer of the Ben 10 comic series. Number four comes out this week from IDW. With me from Austin, from a van in South Austin, is Drew Edwards. <laughs> a band van. A, ba- a van belonging to a girl band. Sandy <laughs> the Vandy. In a right. dark yard in Austin. <laughs> Drew Edwards, writer of the wrong, long-running, Halloween, uh, <laughs> long-running webcomic Halloween Man, now from MonsterVerse Comics and a contributing writer to Rockabilly Online in MonsterVerse's Tales from the Grave comic series, Drew Edwards. Hello. Hello. From the van. Hello. Also in Austin, and presumably not sitting in a darkened van in somebody's yard, Tony Salvaggio, writer of... And if he is, we really don't want to know about it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got candy. Uh, what? <laughs> Tony you're, you're in a van. You can be in a van. Yeah. Yes. Apparently, band membership gets you the right to sit in a dark. So it would only be creepy yard. if Jason was sitting in a van. Which, ironically, <laughs> we actually have a van outside our house as well today because right. we rent, we rented one because our car's in the shop. Yeah, but it's so snowing, go. so that's not right. going to happen. Um, <laughs> all right, Tony Savaggio, writer of the Victorian mech comic Clockworks from Humanoids and Psychom, the manga from Right Stuff and Tokyo Pop, lead singer of the band Deserts of Mars. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. Howdy, and. Also in Denver with color commentary, host of the mom-oriented podcast Pod Moms, as always, attorney Julia Guzman. Say hello. Hola. Hola. Okay. According to Wikipedia, Sixth Sense is a 1999 American supernatural thriller film written and directed by M. Night Shyamalan, or that's how everybody pronounces it, and I'll go with that. The film tells the story of Cole Sear, Haley Joel Osment, a troubled, isolated boy who is able to see and talk to the dead and an equally troubled child psychologist, Bruce Willis, who tries to help them. The film established Shyamalan as a writer and director and introduced the cinema public to his traits, most notably his affinity for surprise endings. The film was nominated for six Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Sixth Sense. This is where we're going to wrap up our so-called Haunted House retrospective for now, because next week we're going to be back with Dracula. So uh, this, is, this is the last... Haunted House movie we're going to be doing for a bit. I want to, and it's an interesting one to wrap up with because it seems so important uh, to ghost stories of the last 20 years. So I want to get your first impressions, and then we'll go into some of the topics. So let's go, Tony, Julia, Drew, and then I'll go. Um, we'll keep it short, and then we'll move right in. Tony, first impressions, The Sixth Sense. Um, I, I really liked the movie. Um, I liked it when it first came out, and... Sadly, like, I don't know, for whatever reason, it I didn't notice things until well into the movie, despite the fact I had friends, you know, I'm sure we all had friends. I, I knew it as soon as the opening credits came up. I knew it mm-hmm. when I was five, and I knew there was going to and I looked into the future <laughs> yeah, that's, that's and saw. That's Dennis Benyazovic, if you're listening. Yeah, and <laughs> which I think, for the most part, is total BS. And by the way, if you are listening to this and you want to watch this unspoiled, which I highly recommend, Turn off the podcast now, watch it, <laughs> yes. and come back. Because, I mean, this, like, for me especially, the movie is not the same if you know, even if you guess it early on, like I said, just come back. <laughs> it's okay. We'll be here. <laughs> we'll put it up on the web. But, uh, well, but yeah, wait, I really I like the movie. Yeah. There's solid, really solid performances. Um, I think yeah. this is probably my second favorite of his movies, Unbreakable being the one that I can watch over and over and over. Um, mm. and don't mind the twist. I think it's just really super solid, in my opinion. But, um, yeah, it's really good. Uh, it's still scary in the parts that are scary. Um, again, I did kind of, like I said last time, watch it a lot more forensically this time, but we can get into that. But, yeah, I, I think it's a solid film. Not sure if I would watch it a ton of times, because, again, I just, once you kind of see the twist, it loses a little bit. The performances are so solid, it's worth watching again. Very 
very good. Julia, what are your opening thoughts? Um, I agree with uh, everything Tony said. I um, I think that it's definitely worth seeing for sure at least twice because I think it's great to watch it before you know the twist and then once you know the twist, go back and watch it again with that in mind. And that's really interesting. And then for me, I watched it twice when it first came out and then haven't watched it since. And now, having watched it as a parent of children the age of this little boy, oh, my gosh, it's a completely different experience for me to see it that way because it was just uh, – oh, I can imagine. I mean, to see a little boy going through what he's going through, oh, my gosh, just heartbreaking. Like, I just really saw it from Tony Collette's perspective, the whole film. So um, so that was really interesting. So I think I'll, I'll enjoy talking about that a little bit. Wow. Um, okay, Drew, what are your thoughts on the success? I, I – when I first saw this movie in the theater, and, and keep in mind, I, I'm sure people who have listened to this podcast know I'm I'm not a sap, you know I'm not I'm not one that that easily breaks down or you know is, is too as they say sensitive. But uh, the first time I saw this movie in the theater, I broke down and I bawled and I bawled and I bawled and I bawled and. Uh, because this is such an overwhelmingly sad movie, and I kind of forget that every time I watch it. And even though it is an excellent movie, it's well made. The acting is great. The direction, the direction is great. The, the cinematography is great. It's got this great actor. I sort of hate this movie because it always <laughs> makes me feel like a piece of crap. And wow. I, I'm kind of like I literally just finished the, watching this before I called in, and I'm sort of <laughs> feeling like a piece of crap right now. And Honestly, when I know the twist and I'm watching it with the perspective of the twist, it makes me feel even worse for Bruce Willis, which subsequently makes me feel even more like a piece of crap. So Mm -hmm. while I think this is an excellent movie, I kind of hate it, and it makes me feel like there's so much about it that just makes me feel upset. Wow. Okay. So I hope you get get more into what it is that, that you find the most upsetting about it, because I, I guess it because it's unusual to be that overwhelmed by the feeling, right? You know, I mean, yeah. Like if you take the end of of the episode of Twilight Zone where Burgess Meredith winds up alone after the apocalypse and he broke his glasses, it's really sad. But I don't remember being like, I don't remember being really devastated by it. And maybe um, maybe I'm not. Um, so is it the loss of of Bruce Willis's future that makes you the most sad? The fact that he doesn't you know, know I have I have my own personal experiences without turning this into a a a, a, a pulpit for for me. Right. You know, I have my own experiences with people who have been taken away a little yeah. too young. And not that Bruce Willis is super young in this movie, but I just feel so strongly for his character and you know i mean you know i'm just gonna i guess out the the twist right here but the fact that he does not know he's dead and that he thinks his wife is cheating on him and he's going through the motions of trying so hard to save this marriage it just makes me revolted like I just like I wanted to smash my my laptop screen while watching every scene about that. It just makes me so upset. And you know, there's other movies that make me upset. Like I I feel a little bit upset at the end of King Kong, but it's not the same kind of upset. You know, yeah, this, this, it's definitely. This, this, you know, I I agree with you. Like it's one of the most the relationship feels really real. Like yeah, despite the fact some wrong turns and I dislike a. A lot of later M Night movies, man, he really like when you when you know it when you don't know you're like wow this sucks that their marriage is so crappy, and when you right. do know what it is, it's worse <laughs> because you know it's futile. He's full of loss that he doesn't know it, but he's full of loss in a different way, and it it is it's rough. I will yeah. I totally well, agree. You know, having been, you know, I, I, you know, I haven't ever lost a spouse, not this way, but I, I, you know, I've lost loved ones. And I also like, you know, the, when she's like sitting there watching the, 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 the video, uh, it, yeah. I know what it's like to feel like that. So I just feel terrible for her. I mean, this, this movie, 
again, kudos for all the actors involved, but I just feel like a piece of crap right now. How many just, times just, can I say piece of crap? No, no, no. And and that's and that's fine. I, that's that's really fascinating. And and I think um you know, we 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 ride along this edge where art on the one hand is supposed to um is supposed to affect us, but on the other hand, we really resent it when art affects us too deeply. I know that I felt that way about um, House of uh, House of a Thousand Corpses, you know, where I felt like I felt overly manipulated by it, even though, you know, it, it's it, you know other people didn't didn't feel this way, but it, or they would say, well, the way you're feeling is the way you're supposed to feel. It's what the art's supposed to do. And I was like, well, but I don't want that. I'm, I'm you know, I, I just felt really. I weird. you know I I can't fault. You know, I'm not going to fault for the movie. I'm not even going to say that it's a bad movie. You know, that's sure. that's that's impo- that would be uh, dishonest of me. But I can say like this is definitely not like a lot of the movies we watch. Yes, they're they're horror movies and they're scary movies, but they're 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 entertaining scary. You know, they're they're entertaining. You know, and yes, even if there's a level of, like the others, it's a terribly sad movie, but it's more entertaining. Like more of an entertaining movie than this. Absolutely. This yes. is not. This is not a movie I would want to watch on a regular basis because it just leaves me feeling like emotionally devastated. I, no, I understand completely. That's interesting. I, I yeah, I, I didn't. Um, it's strange that I didn't react that way, or rather that I was more overcome by the aesthetic sense of it, which I really love. You know, so so that's fascinating. Okay, but my quick. My quick first impression of this, and then we'll go straight into um, talking about, you know, whether or not uh, how this movie works overall. Um, I thought this was a very scary movie. I really felt badly for the movie, which is absurd, of course, that people remember this movie as the movie with a twist ending. And weirdly, and that poisons people against it because they're like, oh, I don't need to see that movie again because it's like a crossword puzzle that I've already filled in. You know, and that even bled over into other stuff. Last week we talked about the others, and people said, you know, I don't need to watch the others again because it's one of those movies that came out right after The Sixth Sense and had a twist ending, and I saw it. And I'm like, what? You know, and we don't do that with other movies. You know, you don't go, I don't need to see Casino Royale again because I know James Bond wins, and so that's it. You know, if if a, if a movie is worth seeing again, it's worth seeing again, even if even if there are not more main surprises. Uh, well, so, I think there's a difference, though, to be honest with okay. you. There's, a, there's the difference, even in Unbreakable, where it's kind of like, whoa, that that happened, you know. Um, yeah. A movie where you're like, oh, wow, James Bond wins is different than a movie <laughs> where you're laying clues to the yeah. audience and may or may not be, like, poking fun at them if they didn't get it. Well, so, and this is our first topic, so let's go straight into it which is how much of this movie is ruled by the fact that it has the twist ending, which we've already said is the fact that it turns out that our protagonist, Bruce Willis, is actually dead. You know, he's died early on, and, this, and we are just seeing it so much from his perspective, and he seems so realistic that we think he's alive, but no, it turns out that he's dead. And that's a twist that blew everybody away. How much does that overwhelm the movie, you know, and does it – does it actually do the movie a, a disservice? Go ahead, Tony. You were you were saying. Well, I don't think it overwhelms the movie, but definitely when I watch it the second time, and I, you know, to be honest with you, I usually catch a lot of this stuff. I'll go, ah, oh, you know, I I get it, you know, ahead of time. This one, like, it led me on for a really long time, and but when I watched it again, I was like, oh, crap, why didn't I see that? You know, and. Sure. Uh, and of course, like I said before, you know, you got a bunch of people who were like, I saw the, you know, I heard a, the name in a magazine. I knew he was a ghost. <laughs> and like, you know, it's just like it's impossible. Like, I had new friends who were just like so adamant that they just pff, didn't fool me. I, yeah. You know, I went to number uh, six when I was in cool. grade school and I knew he was a ghost. You know, and you're just like, come on, man, you gotta get over yourself. But uh, do you have? T- T- Tony, do you have any issues about this? Like, tell us how you really feel. No, but I, yeah, I love it. It's just so, like, it's just so many people who want to tell you, like, just I know. how, man, I'm the, I'm the smartest cat ever. You know? <laughs> and just like, okay, fun, that's great for you, you know? I think it's but, pretty masterfully but, done. I think you're absolutely right. I think that, 
that it is very masterfully done. Anytime people are not talking to Bruce Willis, it is completely plausible that they're not talking. Yeah. You know, it is yeah, now, I mean, like he's, now, once you see it, it, though, you're like, oh, how did I yeah. not catch the – Well, and you don't even have to – I mean, they, 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 they paint it for you. Once he actually realizes what's going on, he reviews himself all yeah. the scenes that you saw with him and other people, and you realize – Right. Oh, okay. So when he sits down at the table in the restaurant with his wife, there's not a second uh, place sitting there. And when he's sitting down in the living room with Tony Collette, she never actually talks to him. She yeah. only talks to her son. And, you know, like they show you all these scenes over. Sure. And you're just like, wow, I didn't even. But even, even not... without that, like when you watch it the second time, you know, or or if you're watching it the first time and you kind of catch on early, you're like, oh, man, you know, that's. And. I think in some ways maybe it did do him a disservice. Well, the problem is, if this had been the only movie he'd done that was kind of like that, yeah. it wouldn't have done him a disservice because he'd be like, oh, man. But the problem is, you get right. somebody who, who, who's hype, you know, yeah. past this, people, oh, he's the next Hitchcock. And, and the Dave's a career that he nice said that or not. But we're, we're, definitely, we're definitely going to do that as a topic. The, uh, so, so I want to I say that, pretend for a moment that, you d- that you're stuck in 1999, you don't know where this is going to go, you know, that, that it's just this new guy did this movie. I mean, I feel like the movie is harmed by the twist ending, because I, I, th- this, is, this is not the same thing as, I did not see it coming, I didn't guess it, you know, I was surprised by it. But I will tell you that I didn't care really particularly about the twist ending. I thought it was fine, you know, I thought it was neat, it's dramatic, it's just as dramatic as a million other endings that I've seen. But I thought there were so many great scares in this movie, so much awesome stuff. You know, it's very scary, right? And, and, and I think we should also talk about the scares in it. But, I mean, th- there's so many good scares that, you know, okay, yeah. fine, it has a twist ending. I, 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 don't, I don't care. You know, I said earlier it's like uh, people treat it like it's a crossword puzzle that's already filled in. That's an abs- it's an absurd way to look at this movie to imagine that because you've seen the ending – that there is nothing left to enjoy here, because holy crap! First of all, Haley Joel Osment. We're going to get into the cast later, but Haley Joel Osment gives an amazing performance. He's remarkable. Yeah, but uh, but actually, I'm sorry, I'm getting out of order because I want to talk about like some of the scary stuff here. Well, what was your favorite scare? No, okay. I, I, well, I'm not supposed to say not just about the scares, but also you because you're on something there with the performances. I mean, the, emotionally, it's such a powerful film, which is, I think, I was hearing Tony and, um, I, well, I guess, was it Drew? Drew was talking about it. Yeah, Drew was talking about how he was affected by, um, you know, the whole situation with the marriage and everything. And I, and, I, and I was saying that I was so affected by it as a parent, and it's interesting that I came at it now as a parent and you came at it as a spouse, at, you know, because you're, you're, you're looking at it like, how would I feel if I was in Bruce Willis' situation? And I'm looking at mm-hmm. like, how would I feel if it's in Tony, Tony Collette's situation? And that tells you that's completely separate from the twist. That's just completely mm-hmm. it's coming at it from, yeah. like, the relationships and the emotional, just, you know, it's just an emotionally powerful film. Because well, these I... people are struggling with this stuff that's huge. Either way, like, whether you look at it as, as, as you know, mortality and, and no more yeah. future, or if you're looking at it as, you know, marriage problems, or if you're looking at it as a, a frustrated parent or a kid who's seeing dead people, you know, it's all very powerful. The the thing that I find interesting, and this is also completely independent of the twist ending, is how this fits in with the genre of, of other ghost movies, particularly haunted house movies. And this is something that didn't really occur to me until this time. He, Shyamalan is using the idea of an old city, the, yeah. the entire city is the haunted house. Yeah. Like, this mm-hmm. is it. The entire city is Hill House. The entire city is Hell House. Because this yeah. is such an old city, there are ghosts everywhere. And True, I didn't but think... the kid's house is very, very, very haunted because, well, it's because he's the kids there. Are, the wherever wherever the, the kid is, the, I think the kid is the haunted house. I think the kid attracts the ghosts wherever he goes. Well, they, they, well, they more or less say that, but, I mean, the, 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 the fact that there is Philadelphia is, I think, yeah important because they keep going back to the, the, you know, they keep going on to the idea of the history here. Certainly the the relationship to the kid is also very important. And, you know, know, people hanged in his own school building. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine, imagine watching this movie, uh, pretend that you had seen a version of the movie where there's a scene right at the beginning where after um, Wahlberg shoots 
uh, Bruce Willis in the stomach. Imagine that ambulances had come, paramedics pronounced uh, Bruce Willis dead, and then we continued with the movie. Imagine if the movie had played like that. We've seen films like that. I mean, what was the movie, Jason, that opens with, is it, who is it? It's like Robert De Niro or somebody who's shot who's dead, and he's like, this is the day I died or whatever. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, they did that in um, DOA with, with, yeah. uh, you know, and I'll bet you it would still be a good and scary movie. And yeah. you would still feel things. In, like in the scene where he comes to the restaurant and talks to his wife, you would experience the scene differently. Well, that's, that's how I react to it now that I know the twist. When yeah, I watch exactly. it. But I watch. I, I I will say I experience the movie different because it's like I I feel that sense of futility. You know, mm-hmm. he he cannot actually. He, he is trying so hard to save this marriage, and it's actually impossible. And and also though, also the fact that he's she, he is keeping her trapped because yes. she's haunted by him. So even so, it's not just futile for him. It's futile for her too because she can't let go of, of his memory and move on with this new guy or whatever or anybody else because she's stuck watching these films because she he's always there with her. Once he lets her go at the end in the dream, you know, and when she's asleep, he, he's able to talk to her as as the boy explains that will it will happen. Um, he that then she's able to kind of I think let go after that. That's what he said. Tomorrow everything will be different. Yeah, yeah. No, that's absolutely right. I I'm just saying that that the twist. A twist is one of those things that really drives up people at the beginning, but then it makes people weirdly unwilling to watch it again and again. I mean, I don't think there's that many people who are rushing out to watch the crying game again, you know, after they know after they know that that twist. Um, so, and I won't spoil the crying game for <laughs> just in case. Um, all right. I so, know uh, all there is to know about this. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> That was Boy George, by the way. I don't know. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, <laughs> my favorite scare. I want to talk about our favorite scares in this movie. Because first first and foremost, this is, and we've seen some crappy modern ghost stories. Okay, remember that, like, like you know, the others was good, but, boy, the new haunting was terrible, you know? Oh, and there's, there are some good scares here, such as he has this, this thing where he steals holy relics to keep him safe. He's so cute, you know, this kid. He has all of these sort of wonderful rituals that he does to try to protect himself from the whack-ass spirituality that surrounds him all the time. And he has a tent set up in his room, and there's one point where he has to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. And this is brilliant because he has to go to the bathroom, but he's terrified to go down the hall and because there are ghosts and there's coldness and stuff, and it was just so, and there's a point where he goes in, he has to pee, and then something, like, moves behind him. That is, it was brilliant. I mean, this was, you know, I I don't even care what Shyamalan does after this. This movie handles itself extraordinarily well and shows you people being really human. No, my favorite is when he goes into his little tent that he's got, like you said, to protect him uh, with all the, the saints in it and everything, and uh, he's got it all clipped up with with um, laundry clips, you know, with uh, whatever you call those. Yes, yes. Uh, and all of a sudden, the clips just start come flying off one by one. Yes. And then the thing opens, and it's this young girl, and she just throws up. <laughs> That's definitely the one I, where I was like, man. That's terrifying. After the I, TV. I, <laughs> I, I really have to say, because it appeals to the, a certain EC Comics aesthetics as well, I really love the like the 1970s kid. That's like he's like, yeah. Shh, I'll show you where my dad keeps his gun, and then he turns his head, and the back of his head has been blown off. Blown off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It is so oh, grotesque, but so creepy. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is. It, and the wonderful thing is, it's creepy, but since they're kids, the, the girl and and him, they're not as scary as say when he goes in the kitchen and goes, Mama, and that old woman turns around and she's like this terrifying old you know, woman and she's like, you know, I don't know, she's yelling about her husband or something. And yes. um, that was actually more scary in sort of a real way because you're like, this woman is actually going to she harm She's really malevolent. She seems, yeah. she, seems yeah. dang- she seems dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, and she's the one, I think, who opened all the cabinets. Right. Because she's living through, all these ghosts are going through motions for some reason where they are confused 
about that's something that Bruce Willis says to them. They're they're confused about time. They get all kinds of things mixed up. So who knows why? I bet she seems to be the one who is opening up all the cabinets yeah. because she's arguing with her husband. But I mean, that's a, because it does not seem to be one of those movies where the ghosts are really hip to being ghosts, and consequently they're reaching out to like. Uh, you know, to put clues into, jail, uh, you know... Uh, no, this seems to be a worse universe to be a ghost in than the others, because the ghosts can't even hang out with each other. Right, they can't see each other. Right. Well, and Jason, what you said about the time thing uh, is another one of those things after, at the end, that you kind of go, oh, I can't believe I didn't catch that, because Bruce Willis is having such a hard time with time. You know, he's so confused about everything. He's, like, missing appointments, supposedly, and he's, like... Doesn't he, he doesn't understand kind of what's going on. And afterwards, when he says, you know, that uh, ghosts don't have, can't keep track of time or whatever, you kind of go, oh, that's why he was doing all that. But then you didn't catch it earlier unless you're one of the people who knew when they were five. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I should also say that it's, you know, the, the mood. The, there, are certain, there are certain movies really from the 70s that capture mood really well. I think of things like, you know, let's scare Jessica to death and, and – and stuff like that where, you know, you've got a lot of overcast and a lot of, like, real practical sets and, and people walking around outside. Um, this is a movie like that. You talked, Drew, about the use of Philadelphia. This movie shows Philadelphia and the leaves are everywhere and that old old building that, that they're going to school in. I mean, it's it's really – it's – it makes you feel. I mean, for me, it's thrilling. I wasn't as disturbed by it as you were, and and maybe I should I should have been. But uh, for me, it was it was just quite thrilling to experience the the shivers um, of of the movie. Um, and when we get to Shyamalan's career, that's one of the things that we'll talk about is is kind of how sad that makes me. But all right, so we talked about the scares. We talked about Drew's horror at at, at the movie. Um, let's get into the. The performances themselves. So first, I want to talk about little Haley Joel Osment, who most recently has been in Spoils of Babylon, and he he, <laughs> he kicks major ass. It's a crazy, Babylon. crazy plays performance. An utterly insane man. But uh, here he plays like this extraordinarily clever and smart and funny and yet really sweet boy. No, it's one of the best performances of any age. That I've ever seen. I mean, it's because he's so authentic, you know, like just his, uh, when he's afraid, you really feel like he's genuinely af- afraid. When he's concerned, he just seems to be the sweetest, you know, most tender person. Yeah. When he's talking to his mom and like he's just w- trying to connect with her. I mean, that whole, and then his mom, Tony Collette's performance is just amazing too. But I mean, the fact that he's only this little kid, he's 11 years old at the time, and um, the reason that they cast him, aside from the fact that he was just awesome, was that he actually he came in and um, and Mike Tomlin asked him if he uh, had read the part, and he said I read I read it three times last night, and he's like you read your part three times? He said, I read the script I read the script three times. Wow. So this is a kid that take and he wore a tie. With the other, anyway, he takes this very seriously. It's like he's such an old soul. Um, I just I was just amazed amazed by him. I mean, think about the scenes where he's like, like right now I've got it playing in, in my office and I can see the whole business where, remember how he walks in, Bruce Willis is waiting for him, hi, I'm your new psychiatrist, we're going to play a little game, walk backwards if I'm getting cold, walk for, walk towards me if I'm getting warm and so forth. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm watching Osmond look at him and you know now, of course, that Osmond's also playing the fact that he is seeing a ghost. But you completely buy that you're seeing a really sensitive kid who doesn't really want to deal with a psychiatrist, but would be willing to deal with one who could help him, you know? And he says all that stuff that I think anybody on this podcast can, can uh, identify with the stuff about how, you know, there are thoughts I don't draw or write anymore because I realize that I, that I get in trouble, that there are calls to mom and all that stuff. And that's you know, God, all of this stuff is so great. He's 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 really really good. Yeah. Um. Let's see. So that's awesome. And then, well, no, and then, yeah. So then there's then there's Tony Collette, who I think. Well, 
Well, I guess Bruce Willis, of course, is the most important. We should, t- we should talk about Bruce Willis. Yeah, he um, he did this movie. This is the first of, of two movies that he, it says in IMDb, that he owed Disney after he caused another production called The Broadway Brawler to be shut down because he fired the director. Oh, my God. <laughs> and he was... He was only paid half of his usual salary, which um, he was paid $10 million, so poor Bruce. I don't know how he made it to the next meal. Um, <laughs> but anyway. Bruce Willis is really great here. He was so yeah. good, so good. Well, because he doesn't, um, you know, he's just, he doesn't take away from Haley Dole, but he's such a powerful presence himself. And, and you never, I mean, I think that if it was a different actor, you probably would get the, the, the twist uh, unless you knew it when you were five. Um, a lot sooner because uh, he's so good at at playing that, you know, just like interacting with these people as if he's alive and, you know, but yet well, consistent with with the. the I uh, I have to say I think you know you stick in a, a middle aged man with a little boy for most movies, it's gonna seem a little suspect. It, 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 with, 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 if you were to cast the wrong actor, it would seem a little weird. You know, yeah. Bruce Willis is so charming and so like you really believe he cares about this this you know about kids in, in general, but he doesn't come across as a sap because he's still got that innate Bruce Willisness that you know right. you know. This, but at the same time, like this is not a normal Bruce Willis character because there's a lot more vulnerability here. Tremendous yeah, vulnerability. Yeah. And I always liked one thing I – the way I saw it and why I guess maybe why it fooled me for as long as it did was, you know, I really got the impression that since he couldn't help the guy who shot him, like this is his, you know. Right. This is it. This, this is, is – I've got to help this this kid. I have to do this. Like, it, you know, my marriage is at stake. This kid – like everything's at stake. And then when we learn yeah. exactly what's at stake, it's – you know, more weighty, but that he really sells that. And that's why to me it was believable. You know, I did, you know, I knew there had to be something, but I didn't, you know, Mm -hmm. know what, because I really did feel like he's like, I have to give it my all to this kid because that other guy, you know, was so distraught. He shot me, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Like, well, remember what he says when uh, you hear him very briefly talk before he, he, before the scene moves away, after he gets shot in the stomach by his, the, you know, the patient that's broken into his house and shoots him, unlike what should be the beginning of a great part of his career, this patient is broken in, is angry with him for not doing whatever it was that the patient hoped that, he could, that Bruce Willis could do for him. And the patient, you know, who's psychotic, shoots Bruce Willis in the stomach. And then... Um, and by the way, he's psychotic, but he's also basically got exactly what Haley Joel Osment's got. But he shoots Bruce Willis, and as Bruce Willis is losing consciousness, what he wants to know is what happened with, with the patient. He's trying to understand, did I just hear the patient shoot himself in the head? You know? So even as he's losing consciousness, his main concern is for you know, his duty you know, and, and these kids that he cares about. So that's, God, you know, he just plays this so extraordinarily well. I mean, I really like this version of Bruce Willis. You know, it's the sweet Bruce Willis that, you know, the kind of moonlighting Bruce Willis without all the comedy that we lost along the way, you know. Um, and and so it's it's kind of cool to, to see that. Here. Oh, my gosh. And then we're talking about the, the patient, uh, and you've got to talk about, um, uh, not Marky Mark, um, what's his name? Uh, Don, uh, Donnie, Donnie Wahlberg. Donnie Wahlberg. Um, <laughs> he, uh, gosh, he was just, I mean, it's such a small part, but it's so great, you know, when he's going, you know, do you know why you're afraid when you're alone? He's like, I know, I know. And you just really believe the terror that he's feeling. And then after you find out, you know, that he's got the same situation as um, Haley Joel, it's like, you know, yeah. he's grown up with this. You see what, what, could become of this little boy in the future. This is what, you know, if, if in fact, um, well, and how cool is it? character does, does fail. Imagine how cool it is. And, you know, everybody talks shit about, about M. Night Shyamalan, but how cool is it in the script that there's no line in this movie where Bruce Willis hits that on the head, where he says, well, if I don't help jo- Haley Joel Osment, he'll turn out just like the, yeah. the patient who broke into my house. That would be a... Oh, I, that st- 
stupid line mm-hmm. is very likely to have been in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's well, not. he does. I mean, he comes close to saying that because he says, I wasn't able to help that boy, you know, yes. but, but I can help. But I it, help you. It does, this does what, what the, a visual medium is supposed to do. It spells it out for you visually. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. the visual cues there, and that's what good film is supposed to do. Like, if you can show, you don't, you know, this is true of comics, and it's definitely true of movies, but if you can show something without having to say it, that is the way you're supposed to do it when you're dealing with visuals. Now, yeah. now I mean, you know, the, the, that little bit of, like, an assist as far as dialogue is not near as on the nose is, you know, yeah. If they had just said like, oh well, he's going to become a psychopath if I don't if I don't cure him now, right? Yeah, you could have easily had just as, you could have just as easily had some like person chewing the scenery and you know angstily going, if I just I have to help him, if I don't help him, and it would have been you know <laughs> terrible. And we awful. probably wouldn't be talking about this movie a decade later. Yeah, right. instead yes. what we get is a really pretty refined performance where it sells it and you watch, you know, you you get the impression like through everything he says and the way he talks to the kid, you know, that this, this is important. This is the most important thing. In fact, if you, you know, if you're fooled by the movie, you're thinking, wow, right now this is more important than his marriage. That is, yeah. you know, that's rough. So, um, yeah. You know, it's, it's, he really, really got like, you know, I think few directors can say no matter what, what other movies, however you feel about it, you know, I would say that it would be hard for a first time director to get those kind of performances out of people. In fact, there's a lot of, you know, multi-movie directors who don't get those kind of performances out of people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then, to- yeah, and then you've got Tony Collette, who just really plays against um, Haley Joel Osment's character so beautifully. Oh, she's... And she's just, I mean, I really, really believe her as, as an anguished mother who's just go- suffering so much watching her son <laughs> go through this stuff, because not only does she see that he's, in, you know, in pain, he physically has marks on his body. I mean, how terrifying is that? Yeah. You know, and she knows she didn't put him there, of course. Then it's like the doctor, you know, who happens to be played by M. Shalon, is acting uh, as though, you know, she's the one who's hurting him, which is another layer on top of that. You know, it's like you're already so upset that your child's being hurt. And then on top of that, you're being blamed for it. And on top of that, that means that the attention is not being put directly where it needs to be, which is who the hell is doing this to my child. So it's like, you know, it's so, you just feel so, um, so helpless. For her, you know, she she feels helpless, and then I mean, and then and then she thinks that he himself is the, is lying about things, and so she's frustrated with that. It's all it's just I just really felt for her. I mean, I felt so badly for her, and I couldn't imagine. I love I the conversation where they're having they're having dinner, and she wants the boy to confess to stealing the, bumble, the bumblebee the bumblebee pendant, bumblebee yeah. pendant, so called. <laughs> To stealing this pendant that the that the we know later the ghost of the grandma keeps stealing, mm-hmm. and she wants the boy to to just confess so that they can go about returning to being friends because she really and he won't do it because it's not the truth, and it, the funny thing is this is the flip side of reality where you actually do want hey let's you know have a nice afternoon all I want you to do is just fess up to you know smuggling the iPod down to your room in the middle of the night and they don't and so you're like oh, god then you and I have to continue this this stupid yeah. dance <laughs> well also the other bits i mean it and it pains me cuz some of the other movies uh, <laughs> m nights are so painful and they're they're just ah oh, just not fun to me at all um i, I don't even has yeah, and i wonder great, like yeah. like the bits where you know they come home and she tells them all the fantastical things that she did, and he's supposed to come up with all the fantastical things that he did that day. And those that bits, uh, you know, that that you do. I mean, my mom luckily wasn't that long, but was a, was a single mom for a while. And you know, the, all all the stuff that you deal with, and then how you get through the day, and all of that. Like, it's it's really done ex- 
exceptionally well here. I think there's there's it's very believable. I, and I, all I, those bits are just really, really good, and she just plays it to the hilt. It's really an awesome performance. I I like how full of life she is, despite being in this sort of frustrating situation. And I like the fact that they didn't, you know, she's kind of she's kind of cute. She's not like a frumpy single mom. She's no. got the quasi Marilyn Monroe hairdo going <laughs> on, and you know, she's she's <laughs> the blouse she wears. The blouses she wears all wear all, all tend to be a couple sizes too small. It seems to me. Yeah, you know? it's a little yeah, but, it's a little trashy actually. Well, <laughs> I, I, I like that, but I like that about her. Yeah. It makes her fully, you know, that she's that she's, again, yeah. you know, maybe uh, you know that there's that, that that there is this life outside of. Even though she does seem like she's a very good mom, you know, you can right. tell that that. that she does have this sort of life outside of being a mom and that she's a fully yeah. realized character yeah. and a fully realized woman. You know, she, that's, you know, and it's funny, it's like well just a little, a little choice yeah. like wardrobe can make that, make that come to life. And, and if you think about it, you know, there's this tendency in, in movies to, when you give people a wardrobe and give people an apartment and all this stuff is to sort of oversell and it, one of two overdues. You, you can either oversell how nice the place is, and so you make everybody just ridiculously rich, even if they have jobs that would not make them that rich. Or you make them, you know, the reverse, where they're all living in this in this weird, um, you know, Rob Zombie, you know, white trash hell, where you know there's literally cockroaches everywhere. This is more like. Hey, working class, real people. You know, they have apartments. They have some exposed pipes. You know, they got, they 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 dress this way. They're very busy. They're running around all the time. They got two jobs, and it's unapologetic. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just the way it is. And I, you know, again, this is young Mike, young M Night Shyamalan, just observing the world and giving us a really realistic um, presentation of a moment. Well, the 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 the, the Typical thing they would have done with her character is like yeah, like frumpy single mom. Yeah. You know, and you know they they didn't go that route, and she seems much more realistic because of that. Like she, you, you just like Bruce Willis and just like Haley Joel, like she's a fully dimensional, fully realized character. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like I can learn a lot about the way these characters are presented here. I mean, I, I think. Uh, I, uh, it, it makes me want to re-examine stuff that I'm writing and say, you know, are are my characters as well realized as the ones that that we're seeing here, that which seem very real and who I can identify with. By the way, I knew Tony. I did not know Tony Collette at all, other than she had been the star of Muriel's Wedding, oh, yeah. where she played an utterly and completely different character. Well, and she said her has her original accent, which is Australian. That's right. That's right. In that movie. You know, yeah, she's Australian, and and she just played this total geek girl who just wanted to get married. That's her one That's great, a great movie, by the way. It's <laughs> wonderful. Her friends are so mean to her. It's basically just a girl whose friends are mean to her. She wants to get married, and and she goes through a lot of ridiculous uh, things to to try to figure out whether she can get married. Um, it was neat, uh, and and this is the next thing I remember Tony Collette showing up in, and it's. Um, you know, and she's been around ever since. So that's the, the the main portion of the cast. Now let's talk about what the hell happened. So Sixth Sense comes out. Everybody's scared about it. I remember I was visiting Maxis in Las Vegas, and people were like, you got to go see this movie, The Sixth Sense. It's so scary. You won't want to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom anymore. And I was like, well, okay, that sounds great. And it was. And it's so good. So what happened to M. Night Shyamalan's career? Why... And I'm not saying that his career is finished and there's no more, because obviously he still makes movies. But why did his career derail in the way that I think everybody can agree that it kind of did? Well, I've seen a lot of stuff, both some of it was like, man, the media really blew this out of proportion, and other were just him where I saw interviews. And it's really hard to tell. Like sometimes people just flat out make stuff up, and other times you're like, but I really – it did seem to be a lot of I've started to believe my own hype mm. and that's always dangerous because <laughs> like Unbreakable is I think still just one of my 
favorite films all together. And by the time it comes to the happening, and I was talking about this on the chat as well, I mean, you've got a science teacher who's talking about outrunning the wind, and you're just like, what? This is the dumbest, which I saw that at, uh, at the draft house in uh, Heck's Vision, where you, where you actually, like, text funny jokes to, on the screen. It's the only time they allow texting in the theater, because it's a sanction, like, come with a, make fun of a movie. Yeah. And, man, that movie. Good grief. <laughs> well, I, like, it's so just... The I've performances got to and the things like, they say, yeah, and you're like, you watch this one, you're like, how did you devolve? Like, in all the stuff in the, that, whatever, the Aliens movie was, I can't. I was okay with that movie. Oh, I was man. okay with. I with really did. I like, I kind of like, I kind of like, I have to say, I kind of like science. I And I like really? Unbreakable a lot. It. Actually, you know, the, the part. But that's it, that's it for me. The parts with his wife and all of that, again, really believable. And you're like, why is the rest of it so not that good? And, I, but of I, course, I you know I, 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 I can't I, say anything. I, I find science to be an enjoyable movie. See, I can't say anything because I am one of the few people. While I didn't just go ape over it, I actually don't mind Lady in the Water, and most people I know are like, "You are an idiot." Yeah, so, so, see, signs, like, signs are good for me. You are an idiot. <laughs> like, well, how could you signs like Lady in the me. Water? So, <laughs> I, you, know, I, you, you want to know what I think it is? I mean, I do think there is that element of he started to believe his own press, but his own press was like. The Sixth Sense came out and was like, he's the new Hitchcock. He's the new Rod Serling. He's the new Wes Craven. This is the new king of genre movies. And yeah. you know, imagine, you know, first of all, that's like blowing up all of our expectations of how important his movies are. Sure. Which, yeah. And then, you know, imagine you're him and you're seeing all these people saying like, you're Hitchcock. You're Wes Craven. You're all these people that are re- considered to be really great. And we, right. you know, that's who you are. And I mean, yeah. of course, you're going to start to believe that because you're going to be like, yeah, that's uh, the new Hitchcock. That sounds pretty good. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. So what I think is the problem with that, though, I don't even, you know, it's entirely possible. So yes, probably what you're saying is exactly true. But I don't think the problem is that he believed the hype, although that he may have. But that can happen. You know, you can have people become total jackals. You know, and and. But, you know, maybe they still do good stuff. I think the problem is that he took – either he took the wrong lesson over what was great about this work or Hollywood wasn't willing to have him take any other lesson about what was great. No, see, that can happen too. And that's why, like, I want to I give him the benefit of the doubt because obviously he's talented, right? So something, right. something happened, <laughs> like, right. in between this – I mean. And and other movies and uh like Airbender, which is like, hey, let me take all the fun of this one thing that people like and make it a terrible <laughs> movie. But Hollywood can do that. That's the thing is like we don't know what he fought for and what he didn't. And maybe there's That's an article exactly about right. it somewhere. We also don't I mean, know we, we just if he turned about... in a script and they're like, no, you're the twist no. guy. And you're like, but but I have this other thing. Yeah, but you're the twist guy. Give us more twists. This because is I have, I have that friends who actually work in Hollywood who, you know. Oh, you're that comedy guy. Here's this comedy. Yeah. No, well, I have something else. I mean, it's really good. And people read the script and they're like, "Wow, this is really good." But the, the studio goes, "No, no, we we get it. You can do other things, but you're the comedy guy. Just give us some more." Right, and that's what, that's and so you can never really tell between to... what happened and what. I'm like I said, I'm sure somebody's documented this, but it's it is really hard to tell what's him and what the machine, you know. But that's so endlessly frustrating to artists of all kinds where, you know, I mean, you, you're you a musician and you want to play your new stuff off your new album. Everybody wants you to play the hits that you've been playing for the last 50 years. And it's like, you know, I don't want to play that crap. But that's what they want from you. So the question is, do you become who you really want to be and do the art you really want to do, or do you do what's commercially, um, what, what, the, what your audience wants and what's commercially going to be pay off more? It depends on what kind of person – you want to be like, do you want to make tons of money or do you want to be an authentic artist and just be your own person? So, I mean, he really would have had to have come up with the next brilliant twist and the next brilliant setup for it every single time. If he wanted to keep, you know, that thing, no, no, I, that's not what he wants to do. I got the impression that was what he was at least trying to do or the way people were, 
we're setting expectations for, for yeah. him that, hey, twist endings is going to be the thing. But if you look at what makes this movie so great, first of all, it is scary as hell, mm -hmm. and it has really wonderful, intimate uh, uh, relationships and characters. It is a Stephen King kind of story, and you could get rid of the twist ending, and it would still be a really good ghost story. Yes. Yeah. I hate. Uh, I really wish the twist endings didn't get the hype that they do. Oh, but see, I, I disagree. I love twist endings. To me, if if something has a good twist ending, that's what the hook that brings you into the film. And then the film has to be great to be great film, of course. But I mean, that's if if somebody tells me, oh my gosh, I watched this movie it has the best twist ending, I'm much more likely to go than if they go, it's so creepy. I'm like, well, there's a million creepy movies. You know what I mean? I just love. I, that's just a hook. It's a hook. That's really interesting. I. I yeah, I, it doesn't. It does not matter to me if you have a twist in. Honestly, uh, it uh, it it's just not. It's not something that I respond to. I think it's fine, but it, I don't think it's any more interesting than you know particularly good scenes or particularly good costumes or, or anything else. You know, because you know the hooks on a on a plot are just you know we can all fill out a Sid Field sheet and, and, and come up with a twist. I, it's just not, and, and, oh God, I just want to stab myself in the head with a fork with what this actually did with movies for the next like 15 years or whatever after this came out, because people started insisting on turning all, every movie on its head in the last like 10 minutes, which just drove me insane. It's like, but that's oh, kind well. of like getting, but that's kind of like getting, uh, I know a lot of, disgruntled horror fans who got mad at, or who were like, oh, I hate Scream because Scream made, after Scream came out, everything had to be funny. I was like, well, right. but Scream's, <laughs> Scream's, a good, Scream's a good movie, and it's good yeah. because it's funny. So yeah. what's wrong? Don't, don't, don't hate the fact that there's a lot of producers in Hollywood with no vision. You know, don't, don't, hate, don't, the, hate, don't hate the original because everybody's a copycat. That's yeah. true. Exactly. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So, I mean, I wish that people would take the lesson that what make what sells tickets is a movie that everybody loves to watch and feel something about, and it really doesn't matter actually what the form of it is. I <laughs> I believe that sincerely. That is a lesson though that nobody is ever ever going to take. You know, <laughs> that that just yeah. doesn't happen. But it does create some eye rolling things. Like for me, if I never see another movie, even though it's beautifully acted and extremely well filmed. If I never see another movie that has the twist that Shutter Island has, I will be happy. Cause, I man, did not see Shutter Island. I it's don't. awesome. It's actually like a, like it's a really good movie, but as soon as I was like, oh, no, this again. Like, I really did feel that and just, or Good Grief Identity. That, that's, now that's one where the twist comes so early <laughs> That it doesn't, yeah. the whole, like, last 20, 30 minutes of the movie, it doesn't matter. Like, I was like, wow, this, I don't even care. I could have turned it off. It would have been fine. Right. It, 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 it uh, is annoying when you so find out that the crummy. imaginary people really, truly didn't even exist, even in their own world. I yeah. mean, that is that is deeply annoying. I mean, I, I, so I, as I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if, that's, if, if this caused identity to be made, then I... I that is well, this, a I think this caused a lot. Of, I think this caused a lot of movies to be made. I mean, this this you know I mentioned Scream earlier. This this is definitely even though it's it's at the, the tail end of the '90s. This is definitely one of the definitive genre movies of right. that time period. And and that sort of you know mid to late '90s boom of genre movies that we suddenly had in in the wake of of movies like Scream. Suddenly it became more mainstream. To make, yeah. you know, scary movies, and but you know the thing that was great about this is this was not like what everything else was doing at the time, and then this stood out, and then suddenly everybody was rushing to copy this, which you know was you know yeah. again unfortunate, but it's still a, you know, as much as much as it makes me have butterflies and knots in my stomach, it's still an excellent movie. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we should get to our final thoughts for the sixth sense, and then uh, which that sounded like. So let's do some really quick final thoughts, and then come around to endorsements. Um, all right, going in the same order, it was I think it was Tony, Julia, Drew, and then me. So um, Tony, 
final thoughts. And you've probably come pretty close to them, but, but here we go. Yeah, I mean, like I said before, I really – it's not a movie I watch in the same way, that's for sure. But it's worth watching – you know, again, since I am watching it more, like I said, forensically, like the last one, like, ah, oh, I missed that. And, okay, I caught that, but I totally thought of it differently, that kind of thing. Um, I still think that it has it's such has such good performances. I mean, if you're going to make a twist film, it is worth adding this to the movies you need, absolutely need to see. And, and, you know, and again, I think what we were talking about, like, it's also easy for people, it happens a lot, to see a movie and see its success and see the wrong thing that made it successful. Yeah. Under a lot of other directors, this movie would not have been as successful. It wouldn't have gotten the performances with a, lot, with a different cast, even. And so I think it's really easy for people to go... You know, that's why we got so many kind of not the great ones was people go, oh, well, it's the thing. And yeah. you're like, well, no, you, you kind of have to see it as a whole, like why yeah. this was good. And I I think it still really holds up. Um, I, again, you know, Unbreakable is my favorite of his movies. And, I, you know, unless something changes, it'll probably stay that way. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I really enjoyed it. It was worth watching again. It's not one I'll watch, like, on constant unless I'm, you know, studying it as a thing, but um, it is worth, you know, getting it out from time to time and going, wow, you know, this was, this was really solid. So, absolutely. Uh, Julia, what are your final thoughts on The Sixth Sense? Well, you know, in addition to what I said about how it's um, compelling as a character study, really, um, I also think it's a good ghost story. I mean, I, I think it's a lot of fun to see i've enjoyed this particular retrospective because i i enjoy seeing different interpretations of why ghosts are as they are and what are they you know mm -hmm. um and I, I think this is an interesting uh look at you know the, the, this whole idea that the ghosts can't see each other and that they don't know they're dead and that whole thing and that and that they can be freed from it i mean clearly after this, it seems to be that Bruce Willis will be able to go on and that a lot of these folks have been able to go on because they've been able to address whatever need they needed to deal with by telling, you know, um, uh, Cole, you know, what, what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. So I, I like that. I think it's a neat – it's not this hopeless thing like the others. Man, the others just felt so – Just I, and it ended so depressingly because these guys were just <clears throat> stuck in the house. I mean, like forever – so um, this, at least, you know, there's some hope that these guys can go on and, and have an afterlife beyond this one, you know. But uh, so I like that. I didn't mention that earlier, and, and that's that's kind of a neat um, a neat part of it as well. But I love this film. I think it's a great movie. Very cool. Uh, Drew, final thoughts on The Sixth Sense? Um, again, this is, a, this is a good movie, a great movie even for, for all the reasons we've discussed here, but it is going to be a long time before I watch it again, because, you know, I don't think this movie is any fun to watch. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I said this before we started recording. I remember Julia's reaction to return of the living dead. I think yeah. my reaction here is akin to that. I just find it so upsetting on so many levels. And I just, it's, you know, like I, I, I want this. I think it's an excellently made movie, but it's don't watch it unless you got some some Kleenex behind it and you're prepared to feel like a like a piece of crap for the rest of your day because that's how you're gonna feel, and that's okay. You know, sometimes movies can make you feel that way, but this is definitely not a movie that I'm gonna I'm gonna be revisiting anytime soon. All right, and that's and that's totally fair, and I think I I think. Yeah, yeah. We've all had some of these where we're like, I, there's, you could not pay me to watch. This. And there are certain movies that we're never going to even touch on the podcast because, uh, you know, I'm like, there's no way in hell would I subject myself to that. Um, there's not even one. movies I see, like where I see the ad and go, nope, not, you know, no. there was yeah. one oh, something that looked really good that two name actors with it really, it just looked like a troubled marriage. Was it a DiCaprio movie? I can't remember the name of it, but I saw the ads and was like, oh, man, no. Why would I put myself through that? 
Mm-hmm. I, yeah, there's no way I'm watching. Are you thinking about Re- like Revolution Road or whatever? Oh, maybe that was it. Yeah. And I yeah, watched I the trailer the and was like, mm, uh, there's no, <laughs> you know, life can be Yeah, some movies sucky. are just bummers, and I'm like, no, no way. And some are like grotesque torture crackpot shit, like, like you know, uh, the, I can't believe that on some some of the podcasts people are forcing themselves to watch, uh, what is it, Human Centipede? And Human Centipede, oh, yeah. too. I'm like, there's no way in hell I would watch both movies in that series. That's crazy. Anyway, but this is not yeah. uh, that. Even is, Centipede, no. to me, sounded more like the plot of a Wayans Brothers movie than a horror film. A what Brothers movie? The Wayans Brothers. Wayans oh, Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I, no, you're right. It sounds like a skit, you know, so, uh, but it, whereas other people, um, you know, could watch something. Like, I remember I was talking to uh, somebody who's, who was into, you know, scary, violent movies, and I said, I, you know, I always worry, you know, I, I feel for the characters, and he goes, I, he, he just regarded it as cartoons. So, okay, fine. But, um, uh, well, it's all, it's all in how it's done, and if we ever get around to doing movies that actually are cartoonishly violent like Evil Dead 2, then we can we can touch on that subject. And uh, uh, and from the cat from the mm-hmm. from the chat room, yes, it, it, from from the chat room we've got, you know, various reactions and and you know, people are calling it overrated, which I think is is fair. I mean, some people some people feel I I personally I really enjoyed this movie. This one this one was pretty strong for me. So it goes. Um so let's come around for endorsements. That's that thing or things that you want people to check out in the next week. So same order. Um, Tony, do you have anything to endorse for us this week? Oh man, lately I've been really. <laughs> it's been. I haven't really had anything. Um, darn. No, no, I'm no it's fine. To think of what. Uh... I'm going to send you something if you. <laughs> If if you don't have anything, I've actually got something that you will want, and it's going to be my endorsement. So. Yeah, so. I don't I don't know. I've been mainly going to to shows like um, I'm one of my favorite bands, Big Business. Who actually, I will have to say, as a musician, like that's one thing I endorse. I just saw a link um, not too just recently where they talked about being truly independent, and what that means, and uh, you know what they decided to do with limited funds and make an album. And then I saw them recently, and they played that whole album and are really nice guys and stuff like that. So I guess big business would be my endorsement. I listened to them a lot when I was making, when Jason and I were making Psycom. So I would Mm -hmm. say that, you know, search out their music. And also I should just post that article, even though I guess it's really not related to horror, you know, it's near, it's near and dear to my heart that someone, you know, says like, look, we're selling this many albums and this is the way the music industry is and, and stuff like that. Um, which also I've been taking the other endorsement is you can take courses from Berkeley online for good price. I don't know if it's free. I rain signed this up, but, but I've been taking a music biz class. You can do that. Oh, cool. And you cool. know, some of it I knew and then other parts were kind of a re up of like, Oh yeah, that's how the music biz is now. So, but yeah, those are, those are my endorsements for lack of anything horror related. Very cool. All right, um, Ms. Julia, do you have any endorsements for us? Um, well, I'm happy to be married to the brilliant author of the Benton ah. comic book series from IDW. So, yeah, it's Benton. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a new one, uh, that number four, is that right? Number Jason? four, yeah. Yeah, this week it's getting good reviews. I have a little quote here from your website. It says, Henderson writes a good story. If you're a Benton fan... You're going to get a great new adventure, comic book therapy. So, you know, check it out if you would like comic books or a Ben 10. Oh, groovy. Th- th- thank you. That's mm-hmm. that's very kind. <laughs> you'll, you'll find your payments on the vacation. <laughs> uh, oh, I thought, is that what that's for? <laughs> Drew, do you have any endorsements for us? Um, I am going to be a giant mega nerd um and endure. I'm sure everybody's been talking about it all day on Facebook, but I, I've I've rewatched this trailer five times today because it hits my happy spot. I'm going to endorse the trailer for Guardians of the Galaxy. Yes, I'm endorsing <laughs> a movie trailer. Um, I think the movie's going to tank once it's actually out, though. I no. will I will preface that because it looks. 
I love the fact that Marvel is taking a chance on doing some of their basically D-list characters and doing a mega budget movie, and I love the fact that it's it's got, you know, the, this is like the, the the vibe of the the, the trailer is that this is like a surly ca- cast of uh, miscreants and misfits, which is actually my favorite. Uh, anybody familiar with my own work will be able to tell you that's my favorite type of superhero. But uh, right. so it's I'm basically skeptical. Serenity, only. With it's superpowers, in the Marvel with universe. superpowers, and it's yeah. it, it's it, Bradley Cooper is a, is going to be playing a machine gun toting talking raccoon. Van Diesel plays a talking tree. I don't know if America is ready for this. I hope it makes a billion dollars because oh, I love James Gunn too. This is the guy that did Slither, which was one of my favorite horror films of the last decade. But uh, yeah. so I love the fact that Marvel's picking quirky dire- directors. I don't know if it'll do well because again, this you know th- these are not characters that have even the name value that Iron Man had when Iron Man yeah. came out. Which uh, Iron Man wasn't exactly a home na- a home brand, but you know he had had video games and toys. Like these are these are really obscure characters. So, like kudos for them that are taking the risk and doing this as their next movie. And the trailer is it's got hooked on a feeling weave throughout it, which is a weird choice for a superhero film. Who was it? Was but, that Paper Lace? I mean, who did this? This I don't even remember. Um, the or I think maybe it was Vanity Fair. I, I'm just trying to remember the the 70s. They're playing an AM 70s version of Hooked on a Feeling. Ooga Chaka, Ooga Chaka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one that the one that was associated with the dancing baby meme, which I think maybe yeah. was the world's very first internet meme. Well, this um, this is yeah. this is a, it's a, the, the trailer makes the movie look quirky. I I you know I I am is, is a superhero fan. I'm ready for something that's got a bit of a different flavor than either the the group. <laughs> it uproariously grim DC movies, which it seems like that's what Warner Brothers is interested in doing, or you know sort of the the, the very stoic. Uh, Marvel counterpoint to this. This is this seems again like they're, you know, everybody keeps comparing it to the Green Lantern movie. This looks almost to me like the Doom Patrol in outer space. So it, I I yeah I'm ready for this. I think uh, you know somebody made the funniest comment on online, and I thought it was just brilliant, and it just shows you the level of risk taking that that Marvel will do. Somebody said, you know, Warner Brothers in DC have said they're not comfortable with doing a Wonder Woman movie because she's too confusing to the audience. And Marvel is like, look, here's a raccoon with a machine gun. <laughs> this, this is completely willing to do anything. I think it's going to be great. And that oh, I think the movie itself it. will probably be, I think the movie itself will be awesome. But, I mean, keep in mind, this is coming from somebody, one of my favorite yeah. superhero films is Mystery Men. So, no, no, like, sure. I, I, love, uh, I, I love oddball superheroes. Here's my, here's my thinking on this, is that, well, sometimes lots and lots and lots of marketing cannot save a bad movie. Sometimes they can't get people to go to a good movie. But if you're going to get a lot of people to go, it certainly can't hurt to spend Iron Man kinds of cash promoting it. That's for sure. Because this is not a Mystery Men kind of marketing campaign they're doing. This is like, this is huge. And I'm saying that only after today. Up until today, I've been like, that is insane. Doing Guardians of the Galaxy is the craziest, that is there, this is finally when Marvel is going to go down, where it will be hoist on its own petard, and we will all just shake our heads and go, whatever happened to Marvel Comics? But no, I saw the trailer today, and I am sold. Of course, I could be wrong next summer. We'll find out. Um, let's see. That leaves me. My endorsements. I also have a trailer. I also have a trailer. So, um, uh, But first, I read, and Tony, I am sending to you, because it should be in your hands and not mine, Godzilla Rulers of the Earth, the first four issues. Oh, no, like, here's the deal. I know, actually, I should endorse that, because Matt Frank, the artist, is a friend of mine, and we actually no said way. things together. Yeah, in fact, we want to do a comic together. But, yeah, Matt Frank, awesome dude and awesome comics artist, and no, more, has copies? forgotten more. I have, I think, I have some I bought from him, but I don't know if I have all four or not. But anyway, okay. yeah. But anyway, yeah. He's super cool, and has forgotten more about Godzilla. I thought I knew a lot about Godzilla, and then I met Matt and hung out with him, and now I don't know nearly as much as I thought I did. 
But yeah, it, it is it, for it, and, and, and the Earth is really good. Mini series, or I guess it's a full series, an ongoing series. Yeah, it's like uh, it they, is, he yeah. he posted. I think he posted the some of for number twelve recently. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I that that is awesome. And he you read it right? Oh yeah, so good. Godzilla Rulers of Earth. It is it is really interesting and funny and clever and makes really smart observations about the world in which Godzilla and the other giant uh, monsters exist. You know, it is just delightful. It, and I loved it so much that I actually started playing Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla in my office because I was like, this is this just makes me want to mess with this world even more. I it like has the a Gargantua's uh, cover, which is awesome. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Speaking of so, obscure characters. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. My first writing uh, project, my first ever writing project, was actually a story called The Return of the Gargantuas because I watched <laughs> that movie, which was actually a sequel to um, to the... Uh, Frankenstein the Conquers the World, isn't it? Yeah, Frankenstein Conquers, Conquers the World. They did a sequel that in the United States was called War of the Gargantuas, and I wasn't satisfied with the end, so I wrote a short story that may have been, you know, it was one page long, and it was, you know, the Gargantuas came back. So it was the first thing I ever wrote. Thank God for, like, local affiliates playing Japanese monster movies at, like, 3 in the afternoon back in the day. Um, all right, my other, my other uh, endorsement is also a trailer, which is uh, Penny Dreadful from Showtime. Okay, so this is coming in May, but you can see their trailer right now if you go, you know, look for, for the Penny Dreadful trailer. This thing has, it stars Timothy Dalton, it stars, and I can't remember now, the, the, lead, um, uh, the lead girl from Casino Royale. Ava Green. And, yes, Ava Green. And it is about, it is like Carnival with monsters. It, it, it's this really strange mixed world with, with all the things from League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. It's got you know, Dorian Gray and Dracula and Frankenstein and stuff. But it's very classy, very weird you know, Julia was totally freaked out just watching the trailer. I have had no interest, none, in the new network Dracula that came out. But I'm totally interested in Penny Dreadful because uh, I just kind of like the, the way the style looks. So so check out the trailer. If you're, if you're, if you're wondering if I'm crazy, check out the trailer and let me know what you think. I, so, I, actually, uh, did, I actually did see the, the trailer the other day as well, and I agree. It looks, it looks like it to be in a very intriguing TV yeah. show. I'll be interested to see if it holds up to what the trailer promises. Yeah, yeah, very color colorful. It's one of these movies that that just uh, are, are in trailers that just it's full of red and yellow. So it's it's really neat. Um, all right, so we as of last week are now being featured on BleedingCool.com. So you can find us there. You can find us on Stitcher. You can uh, subscribe to us on iTunes. You can like us on Facebook and leave comments and engage us in, in uh, scintillating conversation. Uh, we just want to hear from you, and we want more listeners. So we will be back next week with Dario Argento's Dracula. So everybody watch it so you can listen to us talk about it. And uh, we would love to hear from any of you. Thanks, everybody, for being on, and we will talk to you next time. Adios. Later. See you. Bye.